Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Drew. I'm an accredited exercise physiologist and also I'm a registered Chinese medicine practitioner and have been kind of practicing clinically for around 20 years now. And I kind of specialize or my key interest is in this kind of Venn diagram of joining traditional exercise therapy movement practices such as yoga, tai chi, qigong, pranayama and modern exercise uh, rehabilitation science. And they're bringing together to create really bespoke, holistic rehabilitation programs for clients where I really try to kind of like um, get to understand the person, what's going on in their life, what their injury is, what it means to them. And then working together was the best way we can kind of help them get back on track and rebuild that injury, restore function, relieve pain, increase energy, and essentially just get back into life. Now, one of the kind of the bedrocks of doing this work is having a good understanding of functional anatomy because I, I use exercise as a primary tool. I definitely we work in the kind of lifestyle modification. So pretty much everything needs to be within this kind of holistic picture of, um, so nutrition, sleep, managing stress levels, good work-life balance, whatever that is to the person, good social relationships, understanding how to breathe, regulate your stress response. Uh, and having meaning and purpose within your life. So we need to kind of like put all that in perspective when we're working with somebody. And when we work in the movement piece, so exercise is a critical piece in maintaining one's own health. And so to understand exercise, we need to understand how the body works. And then we'll understand how the body works, we need to study functional anatomy. And what that means is we're just looking at how the, how the actual joints bones, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, fascia, all work and how movement is actually created. So when we're talking about functional movement or functional anatomy, we're looking at really like what is the function, the role of all these different structures and tissues to create movement. And once we understand that, we essentially we can reverse engineer and work out people's problems and issues, give them good time frames, and really help people guide them into rehabilitation and recovery and restoration. Having said all that, in today's lesson, we are looking at the ankle joint, primary ligaments and structures of the ankle. And we're gonna look at the key ligaments and also these structures over here, which are called the retinaculums, which hold all the tendons and kind of nerves and blood supply in, in position. So as usual, we are using the Complete Anatomy app. It's a fantastic learning tool. I recommend you go and subscribe. I don't get any kickbacks or anything from Complete Anatomy. I just think it's an amazing tool. If you can get into a cadaver lab, like into an actual anatomy lab and get your hands on, get instruction in, in teaching with actual bodies, people have donated their bodies to science so we can learn. I definitely recommend that because just having that three-dimensional kind of tactile experience is really, really helpful for your learning. Um, secondary models are really good, like the skeletal models are really good because it gives you that kind of 3D representation and you can kind of feel and palpate and get the different kind of surfaces and textures. But outside of that, if you're working with um, a app like 3D for medical or complete anatomy, you know, like it's the next best thing. And then probably fourth one would be anatomy textbooks. Um, I've got a whole stack of anatomy textbooks. So when I went through my initial training around the early 2000s, it was hands-on in the anatomy lab, anatomy textbooks, apps like these didn't exist. And there is not really a simple way of learning anatomy. You just have to basically go through one bit at a time, one structure at a time, and get to a point where you can memorize it in that you can replicate the information off the top of your head. And when you've got it to that level, then you can really kind of step up to the next level. When using an app like this, all the information is laid out for you. So it's a really good way of kind of refreshing information. And there's so much in anatomy, like it's hard to kind of retain it all. It's often why you get people who are specialized in different segments and regions. Uh, but 
initially, depending on which part of anatomy you want to really focus on, you want to get to that kind of stage where you can just kind of like pull the information off the top of your head. So that's that learning phase. And um, we're in this really interesting period in history where all the information is essentially for free now. It's all on the internet, it's all on YouTube. You can access all like I had to do three degree, oh, not three, currently in my third degree at the moment, but I had to do two degrees to learn all this stuff, to learn from other people. Whereas now if you're, if you're so inclined in your mobile, you can get all this information for free. So it's a pretty amazing opportunity to learn. So as part of my mission is I want to like help help you guys and share what I've learned. I'm still learning. As I said, I'm, I'm back at uni. I'm doing more study at the moment. So, you know, open mindset, be curious and you'll yeah, be persistent and be patient and you will get there. Okay, enough of the preamble. Let's get straight into it. So let's look at the key ligaments first. So we have this ligament here. It's called the anterior talofibular ligament. So this is on the lateral or the outside of the ankle. Then we have the calcaneofibular ligament. And then we have the posterior talofibular ligament. So they're the, the three primary lateral ligaments or the ones on the outside of your ankle. And then on the inside, we have the anterior tibiotalar ligament, the tibionavicular ligament, the tibiocalcaneal ligament, and the posterior tibiotalar ligament. So what you'll notice is a couple of things straight away. So on the inside, so if we look at this ligament here, the tibionavicular ligament, the nomenclature or the way it's named is by the bones. And so the, this is the tibia, that's the tibia bone there. And this is the navicular bone here. So it's, na it's labeling the ligament from the most proximal bone to the distal bone, or the one that's closer to the midline versus the one that's further away to the midline. So here we've got the tibia, so tibio. Here we've got the navicular, navicular tibio navicular ligaments. So ligaments are always labeled by the two bones they attach to to stabilize. Whereas on the outside, if you look at this bone here, we've got the, this is the calcaneus. And this is the fibula bone. And so here it will be the calcaneo starting from inferior to superior or uh, distal to proximal to the fibula. So it's just that the naming is a bit different. Right. So let's start with the most common ankle ligament being the ATF, the anterior talofibular bone. So this is a talus. Let's isolate the talus. So that's the tailor bone. And the talus sits on top of the calcaneus. Okay. So your ankle, the actual tibia, sits on top of your talus bone here. And here you can see the articular surface of the talus. This is the talar dome in here. And this is the, the flat surface of the tibia. So we have the anterior being to the front, talo bone to the fibula ATF, and there are two sections to the ATF. So you've got this superior one and then you've got this slightly inferior one. This is the most common ligament strain in ankle injuries. This is the where you roll your ankle inward. So if we were to go from the front, you roll your ankle so it comes in there like so. So your big toe goes in, okay. inward like that. Or if you look from the back, you're going to roll in this way. So that's going to stretch or strain that ligament there. Okay. So that's often called um, an inversion injury because you're inverting the foot rolling it inward. Next ligament is the calcaneofibular ligament. So we're going from the calcaneus to the fibula. So typically, if you do the ATF, this one sometimes gets done as well. It just depends on the ang angle that you roll the ankle on. And then rarely, but sometimes you do get the posterior talo figure ligament. So that's going from the posterior right across to the medial side of the, of the talus here onto the fibula. 
So that kind of gives you that three dimension or three directions. So you've kind of got the inferior direction, you've got the back, and then you've got the front. And that's all attaching on this part of the fibula called the malleolus. So this would be the lateral malleolus here. Sometimes with ankle injuries, if you get a grade four, which is called an avulsion fracture, the actual ligament tears off the bone. So you get a fracture of the bone and then a separation of the ligament. And because they're not very big ligaments, they're very difficult to reattach. So it will depend on which part of the bone is chipped off and how much is chipped off. So they can be quite tricky. So don't do those injuries if you can. Now on the inside, we have this thick ligaments here. Now, when I first learned the anatomy of the ankle, this was just called the deltoid ligament. So one, two, three, four, we're kind of considered to be just one big, thick, strong ligament. Um, and they do all work very closely together. Uh, so it's very rare that you'll see these reported as individual tears on kind of ultrasound reports and things like that. Um, although that may have changed recently. I haven't seen a, a, a good ultrasound report or an MRI report in ankle for a couple of months now. So maybe it's changed. Okay. Well, let's, let's review them. So the first one here, the anterior tibiotala. So tibia, uh, sorry, tibia, tailor, anterior meaning the front. So this one's to the front. Then we've got, we can probably guess here. So tibia, navicular. So, so the tibio navicular ligament. And here we can probably work it out as well. So tibia, and that's attaching onto the calcaneus. So that's going to be the tibio calcaneal ligament. Nailed it. And then behind it there, uh, we've got tibia onto the talus, so posterior tibio tala, perfect ligament there. And so that's your pronation, kind of controlling your pronation. So if you accidentally kind of, if you step on something and your little toe rolls outward, that's going to create that injury there for you, which is what we don't want. Now, if we go across the other side, we've got these other huge structures. So we've got the retinaculum, so the superior extensor retinaculum of the ankle. So this one basically keeps all the extensor muscles of the anterior compartment. So if I put in there, for example, uh, extensor, extensor digit. Forum. Let's have a look if that pops up. Put me out of the way. On to the right. Nope. Extensor. Let's go halicus. Halicus means big toe. Where are you? Extensor hell. There we go. Let's go to the right one. There we go. So you can see there that the retinaculum is essentially keeping the tendon and the muscle in position. Otherwise, the muscle would just kind of like pull off. Off the bone and so you can get a lot of irritation in through here uh, so i was working with a, a client uh, last week who has got a bit of a knee thing going on and the tip anterior has gotten really tight as a bit of a compensatory and they're complaining of pain here and part of that is as, as the tip anterior goes tight it tensions the tendons underneath here and then you get this kind of uh, tension beneath the retinaculum here or the extensor retinaculum there. so you can get a lot of tenderness in this region you also have some other muscles that sit up and through here as well so you've got the the two retinaculums let's get rid of that one we'll hide that and we'll hide that one now 
Hey, it's hard. There we go. And then on the back here, we have the flexor retinaculum of the ankle. So that's going to be like basically keeping in place the, the tibialis posterior. So if we put in the tip posterior, yeah, let's see if that pops up. Ginger, cardiovascular system. Okay, we the right one. Beautiful. So we can see here, this is a tibialis posterior. And you can, I've done a whole video on that muscle if you want to check that one out. And that comes underneath and behind the medial malleolus. So we've got a bit of a space here, wraps under there, and then it's going to connect into the bottom of the foot, into the sole of the foot here. And that connects into your plantar fascia. So one of the key, key ways we resolve plantar fasciitis in a lot of clients is by strengthening the tip posterior because often the tip posterior is weakened and it's not supporting the arch. And so then the actual connective tissue of the plantar fascia has to take the load. So then it gets overdeveloped, overused, overstretched, hypertrophies, gets tight and creates issues. So you can see there that like that retinaculum here, the flexor retinaculum of the ankle is keeping that tendon in position. So these retinaculum are really, really strong, fibrous connective tissue. They're not very stretchy, bendy. You don't want them stretchy, bendy. You want them really tight, really. You don't want them like stiff as in that they're not going to move. They'll have a little bit of give in them. Um, and often when we're doing like mobility exercises, which is really quite a, an awesome practice to do, mobility exercises are really working on these kind of retinaculums and joint capsules. And they're not essentially stretching them, they're mobilizing them and getting them to warm up because the fibers of these structures are laid in such a way that like they kind of slide across each other a little bit. Um, and that sliding releases the kind of hyaluronic acid and synovial fluid. So that lubricates the actual structure of the joint. So movement is critical to keep these connective tissue structures healthy. If you don't move them, they tend to dry up and they, that, that oiling, that lubrication is not released. And so you don't get the kind of the, um, the freedom of movement in the joint because everything is actually really restricted, tight and stiff. So there's always going to be this kind of combination of tightness and stiffness of joints versus mobility of joints versus limb joints being lubricated. So you want all three. You want really strong muscles that can contract, relax through their full range you want the actual joint to be able to move through its full joint range of movement, whatever that might be. So for example, your ankle joint here, you should be able to get at least 40 degrees dorsiflexion. So that's 90 degrees at the moment. So 40 degrees would have your ankle up in this line through here. Um, so you want to be able to take the joint for its full range. And then you want mobility in the joint as well. So there's no restriction in these retinaculums, joint capsules, overly tight and stiff ligaments that are too tight and stiff that they're preventing or restricting the movement of the joint. So you want a combination in your training of gentle joint mobility exercises. This is where things like Tai, tai Chi and Qigong are really, really quite effective. Because in both Tai Chi and Qigong, you need to relax during the movements. We're not trying to contract the muscle too much. It's just really gentle, relaxed movement where you're really kind of challenging and stressing the connective tissue structures more. So over a long time, you get very pliable joints. You want strength. So you want to get enough strength in any muscle that it can move the joint through its full range of movement, pain-free, with no restriction, with control. So whatever amount of strength you need to be able to do that, that's what you're trying to work toward depending on what your goal is particularly, but there are some just like must do. Like you want to be able to get your ankle joint, but don't go to that kind of 40 degrees dorsiflexion because then that allows you to do things like squatting down low, navigating stairs, up and down stairs, riding a bike, just really cool movement patterns that we need to do as humans. Um, once you've got the strength and kind of flexibility and mobility piece all working together, then you want to then integrate that into really good quality movement. 
So at some point, you're going to need to do cardio training. So heart and lung fitness, having a good, robust VO2 max is one of the best predictors of living a long, healthy life. Uh, you, want your, you want to look after your joints, so lots of mobility work. And once your joints get to a certain level of mobility work, then your training, like good strength training, becomes your mobility work as well. So these things can stack together. Uh, and then you want good strength and endurance in your muscular system. So strength to be able to re resist the forces going, putting into the body and then also endurance so you can do it repetitively depending on what your goal is and what your role in life is. Now, I think before I, I might have misspoke when I said inversion versus pronation. Even now, I still get those two terms <laughs> muddled up in my brain. <laughs> um, so inversion in is where the sole of the foot goes inward. So that would mean the little toe is going in that way. And that would stretch the ligament. I'm pretty sure I said inversion for the out, outward ligaments. And then pro inversion and eversion is the other way. So inversion, eversion, inversion, eversion. Anyway, so that is a quick and brief overview of the ankle key structures. Keeping in mind that ligaments are designed to keep your bones in position while the muscles are doing the movement. You don't want to stretch out ligaments per se. We can over time strengthen them with weight mobility exercises. So that's where full range of movement strength training is really good or uh, yoga and Pilates and really going out to your full range with control, going very slow and progressive is key. Kettlebell training is fantastic for it. Like there's lots of different ways you can do it, but the key is you want to like take your muscles all the way out to the full range with control and then bring them back all the way in with full, full control. That's the key. Anytime you're getting people to do partial reps or half reps, um, isometric control, hold, things like that. They, they can be fun and interesting to do, but they're not very functional. They don't really translate well to healthy movement in the body. So we only really use isometrics really early phases of rehabilitation um, or if we're doing kind of like core stabilization exercises where you do things like a plank or a push-up is where you're stabilizing the abdominal wall and whilst your body is moving in a, a certain direction, that's where a um, isometric contraction can come in handy, but you wouldn't be doing isometric contractions for squats and lead deadlifts and things like that. Make pauses at the bottom or at the top um, for control reps is great, but I, I would never prescribe isometrics um, as, a, as a rehabilitation advanced exercise. They have a role early on, but I wouldn't be doing them as your, your general kind of practice. So guys, that's the ankle, a quick overview. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, leave a like, share, and comment down below. We're going to move away back up the body and we'll be looking at the hip joint in our next video. So we'll see you for that one. Wherever you are, stay curious, stay humble, keep studying, keep learning, do good work, and we'll um, see you on the next video. Ciao.